Hi, I'm Jane Crowley. I'm sorry I can't be with your class tonight, but I'd like to thank you for including East Ham in your case study. My presentation this evening is entitled, A Landfill's Impact on Water Supply. A little bit about myself before we get started. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in microbiology from the University of New Hampshire. I have a master's degree in environmental science from George Washington University. And I started out my work career um, in research at the National Institute of Health doing cancer research. And then I moved over to clinical a laboratory working as a medical technologist and after I received my master's degree I was employed by Barnstable County Department of Health and Environment as an environmental specialist. Finally I landed in East Ham. Um, I've been working here for 16 years and it's never boring. So I hope at the end of our discussion I've convinced some of you at least to consider Government and um, local municipalities is really um, an interesting job and it just seems like you never know what's gonna happen. So I'm gonna start off with an overview of what my presentation will entail. Uh, Wendy has basically asked that I break this down into two parts. So the first part is basically gonna lay out the story some of the history of what we faced here in terms of the unique characteristics of the environmental investigation. And when I join your class later in the, f in the spring, we can discuss uh, how we actually were able to reach a permanent solution and some of the tools that we used in terms of risk communication to get us there. So with that in mind, I will start out with an introduction in history about East Ham Landfill. I'll talk about the environmental, in, environmental assessment that uh, we had to follow. We will talk about the impact to drinking water, some of the regulatory requirements that are in place here in Massachusetts versus the risk, and then finally about the collaborations that we formed with the Department of Environmental Protection at the state level, the EPA at the federal level, and our partnerships with academic institutions such as Boston University. For those of you who may not have ever been to East Ham, I'm just gonna sort of detail some of the demographics here. As you can see on the map, East Ham is in the outer portion of Cape Cod in southeastern Massachusetts. And in terms of land area, it's about 14 square miles total area, about 27 square miles. And the population is, fluctuates dramatically. The year on population's about 5,600, but in the summertime and with part-time residents, that population can swell to as much as 30,000 um, people. And we also have all the transient uh, visitors that that uh, visit our community and, and go to Provincetown and such. And so our resources over the last two decades have been really challenged. So let's start with the history of the East Ham landfill. Most communities have landfills to deal with solid waste and it was the way and methodology used to dispose of solid waste in the early 30s, 40s, 50s and so forth. So likewise, in East Ham, uh, we had an operating landfill from 1937 to 1992, and it was capped in 1997. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the capping process, it's basically like putting an umbrella over, over the site so that water does not permeate through the solid waste that is buried beneath, and it's somewhat protected from the elements. However, in the town of East Ham, the landfill was unlined, so there was no barrier underneath the solid waste um, that was buried there, and we have, in fact, experienced um, contaminants leaving the landfill and, in, in fact, impacting community wells. So, as a licensed, closed, approved site, we are subject to a monitoring plan. 
And the monitoring plan established by the Department of Environmental Protection requires for us to test for many contaminants, profiles of vo volatile organic compounds, secondary organic compounds, minerals and nutrients, metals, and just natural elements that occur in the environment. So this is done on a regular, regular basis, and we report the findings back to the department. Recently, in November of 2012, in conducting some of these routine investigations, we discovered that we had an exceedance of a chemical named 1,4-dioxane at one of our monitoring wells on the landfill site itself. That initiated an environmental assessment to follow. The immediate response action plan was what was required of the town after the exceedance of 1,4-dioxane at the monitoring well at the landfill. Our first action was to go directly out um, from the adjacent property into the neighboring um, residential homes. And when we did that, after the November occurrence, we detected that, in fact, the landfill had impacted residential wells. Working with the department, we set out an action plan and followed the requirements under the immediate response action plan process, in which we were required to submit quarterly reports. Any residents that were affected immediately were provided bottled water as a source of drinking water. So let's look at the site here in East Ham. As you can see, the landfill is basically in the center of East Ham um, and to the west we have water, to the east we have water. So basically the peninsula is surrounded by Cape Cod Bay on one side, the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. The area down gradient, you'll notice, ha is all developed property, all residential homes. The unique problem in East Ham is that each one of those homes has an on-site well to supply drinking water and an on-site wastewater system that disposes of waste from the septic system. So this was the area that we initially focused in on for our environmental assessment and all of the status reports required under the immediate response action plan. As you can see, we know a lot about the area at this point in time, and those blue arrows show um, the groundwater direction. Sorry. So these blue arrows going in a southeasterly direction from the landfill is the direction of the groundwater, which then discharges to the saltwater interface. Moving on. Uh, just a little bit about the geology and contaminant profile. The site hydrology in the vicinity of the East Ham landfill, the depth to groundwater is about 45 feet. The material, the soil conditions, it's basically um, outwash plains and stratified sands and gravels down to about 60 feet. But there are tight la la layers of material that separate two different layers of the aquifer. And this is very important because in close proximity to the landfill, the shallow aquifer is very high in iron and nitrates from wastewater discharge, but the further out we go from the landfill, we in fact had a lower level aquifer that was impacted by landfill leachate. So again, the shallower aquifer is high in iron and nitrates, and groundwater at greater depths was found to contain volatile organic compounds, most likely emanating from East Ham landfill. And this was proven not only in this most recent environmental investigation that started in 2012, but also from a previous experience we had where, with um, vinyl chloride being detected in area wells at some distance from the landfill. So, 
With that in mind, let's talk about the chemical that, that was really the focus of this whole investigation, 1,4-dioxane. So why was this such a problem? 1,4-dioxane, as I mentioned, impacted private wells down gradient from the landfill site. Historically, it's known to be a, a, a solvent stabilizer and a, actually a byproduct of ethoxylation. It's completely miscible in water, very soluble, highly mobile. It has a very high leaching potential to groundwater, and it migrates through soil and does not absorb to soil particles. So it wasn't a matter that we could excavate and remove this threat from our environment. Its physical and chemical properties are highly resistant to degradation. And the methods to remove it from the environment are generally ineffective and very expensive. So this really caused an environmental problem and the most unique challenge in the town of Eastham was our lack of municipal water supply. When I say this at presentations, it's sometimes not understood exactly what I mean by the fact that we had no municipal water. If you grew up in a city, you don't even think about where your water supply comes from. But here in this rural community, East Ham was the last town on Cape Cod to have any backup plan in municipal wells supplying the community with water. So each and every individual was on their own for water supply. There was no backup plan. And so when we had this issue resulting from the landfill, it was catastrophic. So we had obviously had great desire in my 16 years to proactively educate and outreach to the community about why municipal water would be so important. We tried several times to support that article and it failed to pass at town meeting and at the ballot. The issue with water supply wasn't only this particular compound, 1,4-dioxane, we also had wastewater impacts as evidenced by our nitrate testing program, which, proves, which, which proved to be effective in outreach and education, yet we failed to get support for a municipal water system at the ballot. There is also the issue of fire protection. When you have no hydrants or a municipal water supply available, you are left to fight fires with pumper trucks. If our pumper truck used all of its water supply, we would need to draft from ponds, or we had a municipal agreement with a commercial um, recreational pool where we could back our truck up and pull the water from the pool to fight the fire. Not the most effective and efficient way to fight fires. We do have the advantage of a very coordinated municipal um, system where fire departments work together seamlessly. And as soon as we call out for mutual aid, those individual towns send their pumper trucks. There is a system and uh, there is a process, but we know that this is not the best operating system. So therefore, all those reasons together were the reasons that we tried to be proactive educate and outreach to the community on why a backup plan was so critically important. So again, let's talk a little more about 1,4-dioxane. It doesn't occur naturally in the environment. It's an unintentional byproduct of this process called ethoxylation, and it's really meant to improve um, product performance and make, make um, it less abra abrasive uh, surfactant. 1,4-dioxane mixes easily with water and it's been found to contaminate groundwater throughout the country. This is a national problem. The US EPA has classified 1,4-dioxane as a likely carcinogen due to its ability to cause cancer in laboratory mice and rats. 
However, there is no federal limit. So this really presented a challenge to the town of Eastham in trying to explain all of this to the citizens. So this is the chemical process that um, results in this byproduct, 1,4-dioxane. And it can be manufactured, caused through this manufacturing process a, a number of ways. But in general, the eth alcohol and ethyl oxide create the surfactant, and then the byproduct is created. So it's a chemical process that results in this contaminant. So how does it get into our drinking water? Well, this is one land use, a landfill, that may result in the, in the contaminant leaching from the landfill itself, moving off of the landfill site, impacting the freshwater aquifer that's underneath the landfill, and eventually, as it moves on its way towards final discharge out to the saltwater interface, it's intercepted by those residential wells. So that's one way it can get into water supply. But we also know that there's another way, and that is from wastewater discharge. So again, I mentioned that East Ham is challenged. We have no municipal water supply, and we also have no sewage treatment plant. So all wastewater that gener is generated in a residential home is disposed of in a septic system located on the same property as the well is located, discharged, and again, the same situation can result. If the well intercepts the wastewater impacted groundwater, then contaminants could be consumed by those residents. And it may, in fact, not be your wastewater that um, is impacting your well. It could be someone else's wastewater system that in your well happens to be down gradient. So I guess as we looked at this problem at the local level, we really did identify that we were probably looking at two separate but equally important sources of this contaminant in the drinking water supply, from industrial products and from personal care products. So again, sources that were probably buried at the East Ham landfill were solvents, degreasers, paint strippers, varnish, et cetera. It's, we're probably fortunate in that there's really not a large industrial base in East Ham, but we would assume that all of those products probably are buried within the landfill site itself. And on the wastewater side, these are just ordinary everyday products. Laundry detergents such as Tide, things that I always thought were really user friendly, something like Mrs. Meyer's dishwash and soap, I mean, these things, Johnson & Johnson's head-to-toe baby shampoo, these are products from which we will find the byproduct of 1,4-dioxane. So as we began this consumer education um, experience and trying to explain to people where um, the product was coming from and, in fact, trying to explain that wastewater also might be confounding the results that we were getting at the East Ham landfill site. We faced the problem that, due to FDA regulations, 1,4-dioxane, even though it may, in fact, be a byproduct, is not a listed ingredient on the label. So to educate people out in the community on how we might reduce our consumption, it became a very difficult task. And in some cases, during the manufacturing process itself, manufacturers are able to remove 1,4-dioxane. But one as a consumer will never know that unless you do a deep, in-depth review of the products in the manufacturing process. So it was helpful that we, we found this out early on and we tried to um, increase consumer aware, awareness. So 
we talked about the landfill site, and now we're gonna, we talked about the problem a little bit with 1,4-Dioxane. Now let's talk about the environmental assessment. We were required by the Department of Environmental Protection, MassDEP, to submit quarterly status reports under this IRA. We were required to conduct this investigation until a permanent solution was achieved. I've already discussed the difficulty of removing the chemical from the environment. So we were really left with one option, a town-wide municipal water system that would be able to connect all of these homes to a safe drinking water supply. So until we could re reach that endpoint, we will continue to, to uh, report to the department on the status of our investigation. We're required basically to keep in this loop until the site is defined as adequately regulated under the Massachusetts Contingency Plan. Once that is achieved, this supervision of this site will be reverted back to the Solid Waste Division. And as such, um, we continue to determine to define the extent of the 1,4-dioxane plume. And we are continuing with the monitoring program. So let's look at what the end total of properties affected were down gradient of the East Ham landfill. So we have this map here which shows you this is the landfill site over on the western side and this is the affected community. We, we know the hydrogeology in general that the groundwater direction goes in this southeasterly direction. What we did not anticipate was this cross gradient impact. The red line is really the boundary of what we have defined on a very conservative level as the impact area. You will note in the impact area that well the properties are shaded uh, different colors. The red indicates um, properties where there was an exceedance of the groundwater drinking standard. The yellow properties have some detection and the gray properties had no detection. And there is the expanded area out to the west here that was a very conservative measure in us trying to provide a permanent solution that would give us some buffer. So although many of those homes had not been tested out in that far area, we thought this was the most conservative approach that would provide the most public health protection. So let's tune in on the results of the investigation. When we look percentage-wise of all those wells sampled, how many exceeded the very conservative state of Massachusetts groundwater drinking guideline for 1,4-Dioxane, it was 12.5%. So that was very high. And in terms of those homes that were yellow, the ones where there was some detection, that too was high, 48.5%. And those with none detected, 51%. So we're looking at almost 50% of our sample set had some detection of this contaminant, whether from wastewater or from the landfill. And when we look at the results in total, another thing that stands out to me is the fact that if you look at the total number of the 410 wells that were in the study area, 99 were not tested. That's a very high number. So there are many possibilities that if we had a full um, test response that we would see somewhat different numbers. But in general, um, I think that we can be safe knowing that this certainly was a significant impact. So if we pull out and look at the problem on an even wider um, zone and pull back and look at the whole area. As I mentioned, Cape Cod is, is somewhat unique. 
in that we have a freshwater lens that supplies our drinking water underneath all of Cape Cod. And the individual lenses form the watersheds, which then discharge um, to the salt water. So this map shows the watershed boundary um, that is down gradient of the East Ham landfill. And it's pretty clear to see here that almost the entire watershed that we had tested anyway in this area, is the, this defines the study area, but almost the complete watershed is impacted to one degree or another. When we begin to talk outside of East Ham, we know that this chemical, 1,4-dioxane, is um, being discovered and you can see from this map provided by DEP that there are many communities that have experienced detection and those that ha are starred on this map represent exceedances. Again, the unique challenge for East Ham was not that we were the only ones to be impacted by this compound, but the fact that we had no backup for water supply. So our situation was even more dire. When we look at the standard for 1,4-dioxane absent an EPA regulatory limit, across the country, it varies widely. Here in East Ham, we were subject to the very conservative, very low number um, that we needed to achieve because our drinking water is supplied by groundwater, we're held to the highest standard, or the GW1 standard. So the target number or guideline for 1,4-dioxane here was 0 0.3. You can see from this chart that many states have very high limits, and some states have no limits at all. Again, this was a very confusing aspect to try to um, talk with the citizens about what our responsibilities were, what our regulatory requirements were, and what our objectives were in trying to um, solve the problem. So I have to say, we certainly couldn't have done it alone. It really took uh, a partnership. And we were very fortunate to be supported by MassDEP, EPA, and BU. All three of those um, arms of the support system that we were lucky enough to experience really helped us in communicating with our citizens. EPA came down and actually assisted us with the sampling program. DEP also ass assisted with sampling program and helped us to um, refine some of the information, the fact sheets, the laboratory reporting um, sheets that went out to the community. In BU, uh, Wendy and her team came down and attended town meetings where we had um, questions from citizens and they were able to put this in perspective in terms of risk to the community. All were very helpful and we certainly needed all the help we could get in solving this problem. We tried many times to have municipal water project approved um, within our community. And it wasn't an easy battle. It wasn't, it didn't happen overnight for sure. But I think all of the educational steps we took along the way to talk about water quality and all the reasons why municipal water would benefit our community did pay off in the end. I think it's unfortunate that the proactive approach was not successful, that it was more of the urgency and need uh, that resulted from experiencing the situation with the landfill and with a crisis, if you will, with no backup plan that really pushed the water project over the, over the edge and finally uh, gained the two-thirds support needed at town meeting and also um, the approval of the majority at the ballot. In communities such as East Ham, these two parts are necessary for um, projects that are bonded to be approved. 
So I'm going to wrap up here, and um, we will be talking more when I join your class later in the semester about uh, where we are now and some of the um, educational outreach tools used. But I'm just going to sort of touch on some lessons that we learned in the process of this investigation. One is um, you will never see something unless you're capable of finding it. It's difficult to find something if you're not looking for it. And risk evaluation requires knowing what, how much, and where. And finally, new things are being learned all the time and lowered detection capability in the laboratory improves our ability to see very, very small amounts of contaminants that enter our environment and may in fact impact public health. The second lesson, and this is a big one, and I'm sure that your class focuses on this issue all the time, it takes a community to support change and change is never easy. It's particularly true on Cape Cod. People do not like change. We certainly couldn't have done this alone, and those partnerships and collaborations are key to bringing your message home. We had very involved citizens, action groups, our consultants, of course, DEP with the risk communication, EPA with the support on the ground, BU with the Superfund research team coming to our meetings and talking individually with people who had very serious questions, very concerned about their health impact and the impact to their children, and also um, Board of Health and so many more. It really would not have been possible without all of that assistance. So the third lesson, the third and final lesson is if I can just um, share one thing, make the information simple. It really has to be understandable. And in terms of education and outreach, you have to use every method available. What works for one group doesn't necessarily work for another. And in a community such as this, with a high degree of elderly population, really those face-to-face -face meetings were very important. Um, so you just have to keep an open mind, and one method isn't going to work. Social media won't work for everyone, but you have to keep an open mind and just keep at it. The people that were here yesterday are gone tomorrow, and this education process continues. In terms of risk communication, when you're dealing with something like an impact of water on a to a community, it's very important to keep the discussion fair and balanced. We all wanted municipal water as a backup plan to provide safe drinking water to the community, but we needed to put it in perspective and be fair and honest and balanced about the conversation. And um, Wendy and her team was really able to assist us in that regard. So with that said, three lessons learned. I'll just conclude my discussion for today. 1,4-Dioxane is considered to be a likely carcinogen on EPA's contaminant candidate list. Municipal water in East Ham will eliminate potential exposure to the citizens and protect public health. That's the end message. We need to continue to protect our new municipal water supply system and private wells. We will have private wells in East Ham for decades to come in areas where a hookup is not a mandatory requirement. So what's our best option here to get rid of this contaminant of emerging contaminant of concern from our environment? The best option, it's probably proactive proactive consumer action to remove it from products to prevent pollution. It seems possible. So I'm going to end up here with a quote from Theodore Roosevelt, and I think he said it best. 
nothing in this world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, and difficulty. And I think in our fight to pursue municipal water in the town of East Ham, we experienced all three of those. So victory, that might be reformulization. We'll see how that works out. So this is my concluding slide. I'm sorry I'm not able to take your questions personally today, but um, if you do have any questions before I join your class later in the spring, please feel free. This is my email address, jcrowley at easttam-ma.gov, and my office phone number, 508-240-5900, extension 3229, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.